Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, find if array can be sorted. The idea is relatively simple. We're given an array of positive integers and we wanna sort them. Well, I guess we wanna determine if it can be sorted. If it can, we'll return true, otherwise we'll return false. But the criteria for sorting this is actually interesting. First of all, we need to know the number of set bits within each integer. For example, eight looks like this in binary representation. And so like everything else is gonna be zero. So the number of set bits within eight is going to be one. So let's just assume that we have the number of set bits for every integer in this problem, because that's not really where the complexity is going to come from. If we really wanted to, we could just get the count of bits for each integer, and we can do that in linear time. And then we can just store them in a hash map if that's all we care about, just being able to map a number to the number of set bits that it has. So I just uh, quickly put the number of bits for each of these numbers. Now they mentioned that the main operation that we can do is the swap and we can only do it with two adjacent elements. So for example, let's say these two, they're adjacent, we can swap them, but there's one more condition they have to have the same number of set bits. Only then are we allowed to swap the numbers. Okay, so we wanna know if we can sort this or not. Just going by these rules, let's try a simulation. Let's try to sort it and see if it works. If we're only allowed to swap numbers, we can try to implement a sorting algorithm like this. Let's start at the beginning we can compare eight with the value to the right of it, which is four. Now eight is definitely greater than four, which is not what's supposed to happen. We want this to be sorted in ascending order. The smaller element should be over there. So clearly we perform a swap here. But before you do that, you have to make sure that the two numbers have the same number of bits that are set. And this time they do. So we can perform that swap and we'll get four here and then eight over here. And we'll do the same thing. We'll continue scanning from left to right, trying to put this guy in the right position. Well, it's definitely greater than two. Let's swap these two and we'll get something uh, like this. Eight will be over here. And then once again, we will compare it to the value to the right. Okay, 30 is greater than eight. So there's no need to do a swap here, but we can still continue iterating. And then by the time we get here, we get to the end, we look at these two elements and we say, that's okay, well 30 is definitely greater than 15. These should be swapped. Well, do they have the exact same number of set bits? Yep, so we uh, swap these two, 15 and 30. The algorithm I'm implementing here, if you've noticed, well, I guess that was one pass through this. The second pass would be like this, where we start at the beginning and then we continue going up until the end of the array, except now we can actually skip the last element. Why is that? Because the algorithm I'm actually showing you right now, this dry run where we can only like swap adjacent pairs is actually pretty much a sorting algorithm you might have heard of. It's called bubble sort. It's a pretty trivial sorting algorithm. It runs generally in n squared time in the worst case. But if the input array was already sorted, we could have actually gotten it down to be a linear time algorithm. But uh, the reason it works like this is because if you notice the main thing that we did with the first pass, like we started with eight and we ended up shifting eight all the way over here. We didn't continue shifting eight because there was no need to. The elements here were already greater than eight, but we still kept going. Then we eventually got over here. We're at 30 and we swapped it with 15. So after we're done with all of that, the main guarantee with bubble sort is that, well, now the last element, at least this portion of the array is definitely sorted. Because if there was an element that was bigger than 30, it would have ended up in this spot. We already went through all the elements. None of them were greater than 30. And now we know that for sure. And so the next thing the bubble sort algorithm will do is it'll find the second largest element among all of these. And that element will go over here. And it happens to be 15. And in this example, we can actually sort the array. I won't dry run through all of this, but eventually you will realize that the array can be sorted. If we ever got to a point where we wanted to perform a swap, but the number of set bits did not allow it, that would be a problem. For example, if 15 was instead a 14, I'm pretty sure that does not have four bits set. I think it has like three bits then we cannot swap these two elements 
even though this one is bigger than this one, in that case, we would return false. So I'm not gonna code this approach up from scratch, but I'll quickly walk you through the code of it. So I actually just copy and pasted this from like the editorial, but it's a pretty a standard algorithm. So we have the length of the input, we create a copy of it. That's not actually required in this case. And then we have the outer loop. It always starts from the beginning of the array, but the reason we have this n minus i minus one well, the minus one comes from the fact that we don't want j to be at the last index because we're doing j plus one and we don't want to be out of bounds. The minus i comes from the fact that we're skipping an increasing number of elements from the end of the array. And so we just do two things here. We first check if the elements are already in order, in which case we don't need to do anything. So we can just uh, continue and get rid of this else because I don't know why it's in an else. So I'll just get this out of there. This here, they're using a built-in function to count the number of ones in the binary representation of this number and also the number at j plus one. And so if they both have the same number of ones, we will just swap the elements. Otherwise, we'll return false. If we never return false, then we can return true out here. There's one small change you can make, a small optimization, I guess, which is basically, uh, just to kind of get some space up here, we can create like a temporary variable, which I'll call my flag. I'll initially set it to false, and it'll basically tell us if a swap has occurred here. So if we perform a swap, let's set that flag to true, like uh, this. And then if it's set to true after we're done with this entire loop, that means we performed a swap. But if we did not perform a swap, if flag is false, if not flag, well, then we did not perform a swap. What does that mean? Well, the only reason we wouldn't perform one is if the array is already sorted. So we can just return true from here or we can break out of the outer loop and then return true down here. So I wonder if this code will actually work. It looks like it does pass, but there is a more optimal solution. Let's get into it. When you come back to the problem and actually think about it for a second, not just doing the brute force, but actually thinking about the problem, let's take a look at it. I have this portion of my array. Forgetting everything else, I know for sure just by looking at it that this itself can be sorted. Why is that? Because I have a block of continuous elements and the fact that they're continuous is important because we're doing individual swaps on adjacent elements. So these are all continuous and the fact that they have the same number of one bits set tells me that this forms a continuous block or a sequence or whatever you want to call it, subarray. It does not really matter what these numbers are, whether they're in order or they're not in order. It does not matter as long as they have the same number of one bit set, we are good. This subarray is gonna increase and increase and increase. And if these have one bit set as well, it's gonna keep increasing. But what happens when we get here? If we're trying to create a sorted array, what should we do now? These do not have the same number of bits set. So if we needed to swap these, we would not be able to swap them. How do you know if you need to swap them? Well, it's not just about the element over here, actually, because consider this, like instead of this being a 16, I'd rather make it a 32. I'm pretty sure that also has a single bit set. So this array can also be sorted into two, four, 32. But now when I get here to 30, well, this is bigger than an element in my first block. I already know this element cannot belong to this subarray, so we have to kind of perform a split. And by split, I mean that none of the elements here will ever be able to cross this line and vice versa. And the reason for that is the one bit count. Okay, so now that I have to create this line, I still wanna know if I can sort the entire array. So then how do we do that? Well, consider this for a second. We're gonna have potentially a big array. And let's say we already knew the split points, like there's a split here and a split there, whatever. The order of elements, like we know individually, this can be sorted. This can also be sorted. This can also be sorted. And this can also be sorted. Now we need to know, can the entire thing be sorted? Well, how would you know that? I guess if I've sorted this and let's say I have like three elements in there, 
and I sorted this and I have two elements, what do I need to do to know that this entire thing can be sorted? Well, if the maximum element in the previous subarray is less than the minimum element in the current subarray, well then these two can be combined and can also be sorted. So this problem is just a matter of doing what I kind of just mentioned. Splitting up into like these subarrays, not literally splitting it, but just kind of keeping track of the split points. Like we'll know we reach a split point when we have different accounts like this. And so like suppose we're just going through this array, we go through this, we find the split point and there's no violation. Like this element is not bigger than this one. Or actually we won't even uh, perform that comparison until we're done with the second group. So just to be very, very clear, let me show you exactly what's gonna happen. We're gonna go through, let's say the first group. And I know the size is technically different than what I have above, but just bear with me. We'll go through this. Okay, this is sorted, great. And then we get to this split and that's when we will continue. Then we'll go through the second group. And then by the time we're done with the second group, now we actually have a real previous group to compare the current group with. When we were here, we actually didn't have a previous group. So for that, we'll have some default values. But here, what do we want to do? We want to compare the values. So for the previous group, we will maintain whatever the previous max was of that entire group. Of the current group, we will maintain the current minimum, but we'll also maintain the current max because we're gonna eventually assign the current max to the previous max once we move over to the next group. That's the main idea behind this problem. Coding it up is actually easier than you would think. So let's just jump into that. This will actually be uh, the linear time solution, by the way, and we won't need any extra data structures, I believe, so it should be constant space. Before we get started, the first thing I want to mention is just how we're going to count the bits in each number. I'm just going to create a helper function for that. Let's call it count bits. It takes a number n. And if we want to do it like the old fashioned way, we could do something like this where we shift it to the right and we have like a result and we increment the result every time we see a one bit set like this and then return the result, that will work. And this is actually one of the leak code easy questions, I think in the neat code 150 list, but there's actually a built-in way to do this. Python has a function bin, bin, whatever you want to call it, takes n and then it'll return a string, I believe, which we can count the occurrences of one within that string, which will tell us the number of bits set. So very clean solution. So now we have that out of the way we can get into the rest of the problem. I mentioned we're gonna have a few variables, not too many, current min and current max. Initially, let's just set that to the first number in the array. We'll also have a previous max. We can't really set that to any element in the array, so we will set a really small value, a negative infinity, because every value is gonna be technically be greater than that, so we will not have a violation, at least for the first group. And then we'll say for n in nums, we want to count the number of bits for n. So we can do something like this, count bits n. And we want to know, is this count the same as all the other elements in the current group? Not the values of the elements, current min and current max are the elements themselves, but the number of ones in those is all going to technically be the same. So we can say something like this, if this is equal, to the count of bits of current min or current max. It doesn't matter whether you do current min or max because the count of bits should be the same. So if this is the same, then the group will increase. And we don't really have any pointers we're maintaining for the current group. So all we really need to do is update the current min and current max. Those can be updated like this. Current min is gonna be the minimum of itself as well as the current number. Same thing with current max. Now, if this is not the case, then we'll do else. That means these two numbers have a different number of bits. That means we just reached a new subarray, a new streak. So what should we do? Well, what's the current minimum of the current group? That's this current minimum. If the current minimum is less than the previous max and the previous max was in a different group and they have a different number of bits set, well, then we can't possibly swap these two elements and thus we can never sort the array, so we should return false. 
If that's not the case, we can update the variables. The previous max will be set to the current max and the current min and current max can also be updated. What we're saying is n is not a part of the previous group. n is a part of the new group. So just like we did up here, we can set current min and current max to the first number within this group, which is just going to be n. So this is pretty much the entire solution. If we never return false, we can return true out here, but there's actually one edge case that I'm missing. What's gonna happen with the last group? The last group is always going to have this equality set as true. Whether we have a group of size one or more than one, we will never execute the else. So if I had a group that looked like this, a two, 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 and then one, 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 this part is never gonna execute, even though we know that this array can never be sorted, we're gonna end up returning true. So the way to fix that is with the last group, check manually out here if the current minimum of the last group is less than the previous max, then return false. Otherwise, return true. And if you really want to be fancy, you can probably condense these, but that'll make it a less readable. So if we're returning this, uh, we would want to return the not of that, which will make that this, so not, and then that. And now we have a slightly less readable solution, in my opinion but this one should also work. And after running it on the left, you can see that it does. And this one is more efficient. If you found this helpful, check out Neatcode.io for a lot more. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.